So I mentioned to you guys we use peer cost analysis or schedule overrun, so we have two separate risk registers that we can do. These are kind of the outputs we can get from a quantitative Monte Carlo simulation. So we get a probabilistic distribution of costs, so it could give us P30, 50, and 70 as stated there as an example, or you can ask it to give you a 10, 50, and 80%. You can choose any probability range that you wish for it to give you. <clears throat> so if board will ask you, I want to know if I would overrun 20% on my budget, what would it be? So you'll still do your risk and your costing the same way, and you'll just ask what's 20% what's of, of that value there. So the assessment will still be right. They just ask you for what percentage impact they're looking at. Then, like I said, you get a heat map. So Exco people, board people, the big bosses, big guys at the top, they love colors. Really, they do. Because if they see these numbers up there, they don't even know what the risk is. And they go, oh, it's red. Because they're visual people, usually. They're very visual. They also see figures, big figures type of thing. And it's all about color to them as well. So if there are numbers in there, they won't know what the risk is. They're going to say, we are exposed. <laughs> we don't know what we're exposed to or what, to what extent, but that heat map is telling me I'm exposed. And you'll tell them well, why, and they're like, well, it's in the red. So, which is kind of, they've got it kind of right. So what we do is, on a heat map point of view, you can have two heat maps. You can have a schedule of cost, which means this is, again, what's the likelihood of the risk happening and what's the consequence. So consequence can run in monetary value or in schedule. So basically saying if these numbers would distribute it here. It will basically say the red ones say that either the likelihood is high of it happening and the impact is kind of about in the middle saying if it's a monetary value of maximum of a 10 million impact, it will tell you 10 million. If it's a maximum of 12 week overrun, it will tell you all the risks that's in that little corner. But from the likelihood, it's probably going to have a 12, 12 week plus impact on your schedule. As well as if it's a cost heat map, it will say it will probably overrun budget with X amount or between these values if it falls on your heat map. It also runs off the simulation. They all align. They all tie up. Then what we usually like to do is we do a FFC risk contingency graph. So the blue lines basically when we started the project, and it's very little that risk people get a budget, but if we did gain a contingency on some projects we do, we baseline the contingency and we say we've got 50 million contingency, right? These are the risks in the risk register. Any of them materialize, we will do a drawdown from the 50 million. If we do a drawdown, we'll stop dropping the contingency because we have less and less and less money. But every month or every week, whenever you do a risk workshop, you will still trend what your exposure is. So if you go to a board meeting there and they're going to say, you're well, you only have 50 million contingency and you're telling my risk is 300 million. You're telling me my exposure is 250 million. If all the risks would happen now at exactly the same time, of course. So why is it 250 million? Well, last month you fired the engineers on site. Now we don't know what to build on site. We've got technical queries. We don't know what to do because we don't have an engineer to go to. So until you give us a new engineer and they've done a validation, your risk is going to remain there because now a part of site is standing because we don't know what to do. Or it's June, July, it's striking season. The guys threw a couple of petrol bombs at us again. They burned down a few excavators. So site standing, we're not getting anything done. We are, we are being knocked hard on, on cost and schedule. Then it might start coming down again. They'll say, oh, that's brilliant. That's what they like to see. It's below the contingency line. What's the reason? We say, well, it's end of November. Nobody feels like striking. Because it's nearly Christmas time. Everybody's jolly. Everybody's happy. Well, we might have a risk spiking that if they all come to site and they're all intoxicated again, then, then the risk might climb because now we're losing resources because it's a zero tolerance um, approach. But that might be we're going to December break. We have worked the builders break into our schedule. So there's not a lot of risks, you understand. We've got the stuff we need for the last month or two to, to um, install on site. We're pretty comfortable where we're at from a risk point of view. Lastly, you've got your tornado diagram, which is the bottom right-hand one. So I said to you, you can either rank your risk register to show you which risks would have the highest impact on schedule or on cost. A tornado diagram, we talk about the affected areas on site because a risk might affect more than one area. The tornado diagram will say this risk will affect the majority of your areas. 
So usually a strike, because it's not that discipline that's striking, but that discipline is threatening that discipline again, etc. So the tornado diagram is telling you those risks at the top affect the majority of your areas on site. So quantitative in a schedule. So what we do is we get the program, we import it. It's got your whole schedule. Let's say it's got 5,000 line activities. They've all got activity numbers assigned to them. We take the risk register and we say the valves are going to be late, um, the motorized valves. Where in the schedule do we need to install the motorized valves? Where's the procurement and the installation? So like, well, there's 10 areas on site and only in four areas we are installing these specialized valves. So you're not going to link them to any other activity in the schedule, I mean, because they're not applicable there. You will go and link them in those areas where they're applicable, right? And you'll go and look on what activity, if there's a delay in installation, what will the knock-on be? If there's enough float, isn't there enough float, etc. And what will it do to your whole schedule? Now, what we recommend from a work breakdown structure is you never link more than 25 activities in a schedule to one risk. And very important, never link the same activity to a risk. So even if a risk, there's an activity and two of the risks in the risk register can affect the same activity, never link both of them. Because what it does is it, it compounds it and then it's not very accurate. Is it will first run the first risk's impact and then after that it will run the second risk's impact. So it won't attach and run a risk parallel like a schedule. It will then actually double dip on it. So rather take the second risk and look at other activities in the schedule that it might affect. Because then you'll get a, a better idea or, or a more accurate schedule impact analysis. Look at critical and near critical path activities if you link them. So look at which activities will drive critical path or which ones will pose a threat and knock onto your critical path. There must be no constraints. No constraints, or else you won't get a very accurate simulation in, in your schedule risk analysis. And they say complete logic to be developed, and that's what I said earlier on no open ended activities. And then use of lags or leads kept to a minimum, and it's usually not ranged. We say start to finish links to be avoided. So we never say the risk is going to happen on the start date or the risk is going to happen on the end date. Because if I attach anything to the end date, whatever I link to at six weeks, it's literally going to run out with six weeks. So if you attach it to the last activity, it's not, not going to be very accurate, unless you literally in the final week and now it's going to knock on the commissioning. So link it to the specific activities in the schedule, which is going to impact. So they talk about probabilistic calendars. So forget about the calendar and the schedule. If you link it, link it to what you've assessed in the risk workshop, the likelihood and the possible weekly impact. Forget about what the schedule says. Link it to those durations. Weather modeling. So we say it, attention to inclement weather in base schedule. <coughs> what that means is don't double dip. So if the contractor contractually has the right to provide for one and a half days inclement weather a month, then you must take that into account in your risk. So either in your risk session that you had, say, well, we're going to overrun schedule with two weeks. Say, does two weeks take into account 10 days of weather already, or is it an additional 14 days or two weeks? Try and get it as accurate as possible. And then your activities and your links and that's what I said is make sure if you attach them to either the critical path or near critical path <coughs> ones, don't attach two risks to the same activity because then it will just double dip it. Then the outputs we get with a, with a quantitative schedule risk. <coughs> so at the top right hand corner, that is how your schedule looks. Looks like a GAN chart, has all your activities, shows you what runs parallel, which ones depend on the other one, etc. Now, what the risk would do is, and you'll see those little blue triangles, that will usually indicate the likelihood of the risk happening. And then the little red one with the black arrows on it. So the red bars are usually your critical path items in your, in your schedule, right? But the red one with the black, that is where we link the risk onto it. 
to see if it impacts the schedule or not. And you don't only link them to critical, like there's a little purple one, there might be a milestone that we want to attach it to. And then of course the likely is the blue one saying it will move it out by that much. Now schedule has logic in it, which means <clears throat> if there's no float on activity, and I would link a risk to it, it will literally overrun that activity with that much. And if there's a knock on to another one, it will knock that one on. If there's no link, so last activity within that area, it will just overrun it with a few days. There'll be no knock on. So it's got a lot of logic. It doesn't vary accurately. It's just how do we link it as well. And like you said, usually it's like a plan, garbage in, garbage out, right? So apart from how accurate is the schedule, it is how accurate was your risk workshop done and how realistic is the possible likelihood and, and the <coughs> overruns and the impact of a specific risk. At the bottom, we get a histogram, which is also kind of like distribution. So you can also ask it, what is a P50 value on schedule or a P30 or a P50 or, or a P70 saying, if my schedule would overrun and there's a 70% chance of it happening, when will I finish? I won't give you a cost, we'll give you a date in time. So well, you won't finish the 15th of December 2015, you'll probably finish August 2016. So your output here won't be a monetary one, it will be a date. And then you'll know what you need to mitigate because which risks are driving up your schedule. If you guys get this slide and you're trying to understand schedule a bit better, this would be the one slide that I would suggest you guys go and have a look. And this would tell you that activity A and B, so they don't run parallel. They might be dependent on each other. If we start linking risks, and the two risks run here, how would it drive out the schedule time-wise? And then if there was a gap in the activities, for example, and we link the risks here, well, <coughs> what would the impact be? Because it is very difficult sometimes for people to explain to them how accurate and how much log logic does a quantitative schedule risk analysis have or, or a costing point of view. But also it kind of has to be like for like. So if I've got a risk register based on schedule and time, if I've costed those risks, I need to add it into the schedule as well. So if I go to board and I say, contract or whoever, and I say, well, I'm forecasting that I might overrun the schedule with six months, these are the risks, these are the reasons, it's going to cost you about this much. Because you can't take a monthly expenditure on site and multiply it by six. You can. But then the question would come, how did you calculate and how accurate is it? But if we do the specific costs in the specific areas, and those are exactly the same areas being impacted, and having a knock-on on some other trades, and we cost those trades, that costing is actually quite accurate, if that makes sense. So it has to be like for like. You can't link 10 of these risks and cost 10 other risks and then say, you're going to overrun six months, you need this much money. It doesn't make sense. It, it has to be. You have to cost the same thing in schedule than what you do in your, in your costing itself and your monetary values. So what works? So we say, remember, if you do not know what you are doing in business, risk is not going to help you. If you don't know what your objectives are, I can identify all your risks. Not that I'm quite sure how I'll do that. I'll probably go on well, I guess this could happen, I guess that would happen. But then risk is not going to help you. No, risk is not going to tell you how to do business or etc. We need to know what our objectives are, what is the strategy. And then we can identify risks and make sure it doesn't impact those objectives and strategies. Remember, context changes. And like you said, so risk change over time. Something that's sometimes quite rapidly that things change. And you need to stay ahead of it in, in order to have the most accurate updated risk register to do your costing, to do your scheduling. So just remember, because you know what people do, and it's very interesting, and they do it for compliance and to keep the auditors quiet and happy. But remember, the way projects are going in SA, there's going to come a time where they're just not going to accept overruns in schedule and cost to the extent that it's happening now. And they're going to hold people accountable. And they're going to hold people personally accountable and liable for projects maybe failing <coughs> and overruns and cost and schedule. Is that we do a risk register, project kickoff, startup, just before we go into execution phase. Sometimes do it with a contract as well when we attach it. So, oh, we looked at these risks and we've costed them. And let's be honest, it's sometimes the estimator who quickly did that risk schedule. He ticks the box, pops it off into the contract or the commercials. He sends it off. They say, oh, 
gate review, okay, they've done these things, they're quite happy, they go. But then the risk register is never spoken of again. Till about a year or a year and a half into the project, we're behind on budget, we're behind on schedule. Oh, what risks are we facing? So keep it a live document and make sure when you do the first assessment, it's an accurate assessment so your contingency is accurate. So it works for good governance and, and decision support practice and that's what I said, the guys can make an informed decision if they know what they're facing and how much. And good practice to link to strategic or business. So that's why I said it will roll up. So if your project's not successful, it'll have a knock on, on, on might have a reputational costing, etc. Then we say identify workshops, meetings where context is discussed. So I say have risk workshop with the guys, have all the guys around the table. They need to all form part of the discussion. They need to all have their input. Then if it's strategic of business unit planning sessions, if they're not happening, you need to become the facilitator. You need to start driving these things as well because it's not always up to just the risk manager if you don't have a risk manager. Make sure you write it down. Sometimes I'll get somebody passing on site or in the container or we sit in open plan or pick up on some of the things the guys are saying I think that's actually a concern. Pop my little head over the partition and I was like, hey, what did you guys just say? And they're like, oh, this and this and this. I say, geez, I actually think that's a risk, eh? Maybe it's not, but let's rather just put it down, etc. Which it's saved our butts quite a few times because then two weeks later it happens and then the first thing board, because they never read a risk register, so trust me, they just look at the colours, go, call all of us in. We're going to get all the hiding because this has happened, why won't you tell me? And then we go, <coughs> um, you know you don't actually read, <laughs> but it's in there. Then keep quiet straight away. They flip to the reverse side of the coin and said, okay, good guys, what are we going to do about it? Where if we didn't identify it, we'd probably get a, get a big snack. Because they don't understand it. I think, I think maybe two things. I think they don't really understand it. Or they don't really always understand how much value it adds. Or maybe sometimes they don't want to know what it says because they don't really know what to do about it because they should have done things in the beginning phase. And that's why I say usually when they bring us project risk managers on board and we try and be superman and superwoman but we can't save the project at that time. What we can do is we can say well you are probably going to literally overrun schedule with this much on cost but we can try and just keep it within that area and manage it going forward. But we can't pull back all of that. We can't, we can't change what's been done type of thing. We can only tell you what it's actually going to be. So you go to board or whoever and you tell them we are this much short, we're going to overrun with this time. But we must understand on these high mega projects those guys jobs are on the line as well. So they tend to want to keep maybe quiet for longer and sometimes I think they, they hope it just goes away. They hope just it gets mitigated and all of it. But unfortunately, the more we sweep under the carpet, after a while, it's like a schedule. It has to come out. There's no more float. There's, there's no more contingency to hide it in. Then it starts materializing. And I think as well that when I say sometimes they, they don't understand, it's not that they don't want to understand it. It's just they, oh, yeah, you say this is a risk. Risk means it hasn't materialized. So they think once there's an issue, if it's materialized, then we need to look at it. But then we've, we've lost the plot already. So I think there's various factors, and I think it depends mm -hmm. on where those guys sit and, and in what situation they find themselves in in that point in time. And I mean, you guys will be able to know um, if you run on projects or even in a factory shop is, do you guys have, do you do risk assessments? Do you have risk workshops? Do you have a risk register? And the question is, do you have it for compliance to tick the box? Do you actually literally look at it and say, well, let's just make sure we do X, Y, and Z and, and we, we ought to be okay. Or if we do slip this week on a forecast, we don't just do um, once a month, let's look at the schedule because there's five years left on the project. Because that's what we usually do. The last year of the project, we start looking at schedule and what do we need to do. In the meantime, we forecast a long time ago that we might overrun. Even the planner starts flagging it, saying if we continue, this is going to happen. Is that if, and it's not that difficult then, it's not a lot of admin work, it's just, if we just make sure that this week we slipped five hours, the recovery Saturday we're working five hours, done and dusted, or they're maybe not as productive on a Saturday, so we need to work eight hours to get the physical five hours. 
we can manage it as we go along. But a lot of people think risk is a stick. Just like if I'm accountable, I'm going to be held responsible if this risk happens. And I'm going to be in trouble. And it's not a stick. It's literally, that's why we call it a get out of free jail card. So that I did do my homework and I did tell you guys what was going to happen. I'm not talking about the project risk manager. I'm talking about a PM, a PD, a commercial guy. who has got a commercial risk register that he runs on early warnings or risk reduction meetings. And one thing we must always know what risk management actually aids in very big, which we don't always grasp that well, is it builds history because you never delete things from a risk register. You either close it or you move it to your completed actions and it builds over the months, it builds history. Is that if you do it correctly, when we go to adjudication or arbitration, which majority of projects go there these days, which is quite sad, is we have proved, we can prove from our side that we've done all we could or we did try and do a lot of things and this is actually what we've put in place and we've done X, Y, and Z. And from a risk point of view, I sell a lot with the commercial guys as well. So if we run NEC contracts, on any early warning that we issue, or that we get issued, whether we're a contractor or client, doesn't matter, we should have a risk reduction meeting. So we all know minutes of meetings means nothing. Mediator arbitration says, I don't care, it's not contractual, just give me your contract. A risk reduction meeting in an NEC, if the contractor or the client promises to do something about this early warning that was raised because it's in their camp, they need to do something about it. They bind it to clause 16.4, which means it becomes contractual then. So whatever you promised or you said you were going to do, if you don't do it, now I can hold you contractually liable. And not a lot of people know that. And that's one of the risk mechanisms that we have at our disposal then. So you contractually bind that contract to our client saying, well, you promised me. So under 16.4, we've minuted it, goes into the commercial risk register, there it goes. So it protects you from a commercial contractual point of view as well. And then a few last things is just, so most risk assessments fail, they do, because the context set, setting or step was either missed. So it's kind of like, well, these are the risks, and then you'd ask, well, are they really real risks? And remember, we need to mitigate the cause, not the risk, and I oh, whatever. There's five causes, but we've got three mitigations. We don't really care about this analysis. We just want to get this risk workshop done and dusted. If it's done half, I would sometimes tell the guys, well, you're not even committed, so don't even bother coming to a risk workshop. If the auditors come, you know, ask, was the guy, is there a risk register? Do you guys have risk workshop? All auditors ask that. Whether you ERM, strategy, projects, and then what was the commitment? Because now we're overrunning on cost and schedule, and there's just no comfort that this project management team has managed it correctly. That's why a lot of project management teams get replaced these days. Is because sometimes the things we need to look at is the crucial thing. So you'll see, if you start a progress meeting first discussing risks, you would cover half of your minutes of meetings. Because all those guys are actually saying is in engineering, we've got these concerns X, Y, and Z, we're just actually posing these are the risks and these are the consequences. They're all talking actually, actually about, about risk and what they're facing and what the project is facing. And then get the business team involved. So I'm talking specifically projects. You have your project team on site, you've got a business team. There's no integration, there's no communication until everything hits the fan and then there's also no alignment. So um, that is in a nutshell and I've probably fried your brains but if I have.